Hey, hey, greetings, everyone. Welcome to the EV show by Ludicrous Feed. I'm your host, Tom. Thanks for joining us this evening, Wednesday night, 10th of April, 2024. Welcome wherever you might be watching. And yes, we are in Eastern Standard Time at the moment, which means that uh, I think most of the population is on the same time zone, finally, in Australia. So yeah, great to be uh, part of the group now. All right, well, uh, let's welcome uh, Riz from Carloop, who joins us as always. Hey, Riz, how are you? Hey Tom, going well? Yeah, it's um, pretty much daylight savings gone. Um, it's cooler outside already here in Melbourne, but I was in your hometown yesterday in Sydney, and it was it was it was warm. It didn't rain. It rained later on. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, unfortunately, Rizzy did bring the rain, but that's all right. It's all gone at the moment. So yeah, nice and dry now. Uh, but yeah, did you enjoy Sydney? Yeah, it was good. Um, you know, had a couple of meetings in the city and the rest, and then. Plane wasn't delayed on the way back, usually with school holidays, but then, as I discovered, it's still not school holidays in New South Wales, or they're yes. going to begin next week. That's right. We are very close to school holidays next week. Uh, but nice to catch up with you, Riz, yesterday. Thanks uh, for having lunch with me, but uh, yeah, it was very nice to have you, and uh, hopefully we'll see you again very shortly in Sydney. Uh, let's uh, thank our sponsors, as always, on the show. Uh, we've got Carlib, of course. Thank you, Riz. Uh, Carlib is where you want to go for data to empower Australia's EV revolution. And of course, Cobra Car Insurance. Cobra has launched their EV-specific insurance products. So make sure you check out their uh, website. I'll leave that in the video description below. Give us uh, your thoughts on what it's like uh, with a quote from Cobra compared to your current car insurer. All right. Well, uh, Riz, as always, a big show. Um, lots to chat about, as always. Just going through our show notes this evening. Uh, lots to talk about, of course. Uh, current uh, well, sales figures from last month. Uh, well, we talked about that, didn't we? But... Uh, We'll talk about uh, the new Model Y as well, um, and what else we talk about the the new well the Cyberster being seen around the East Coast at the moment, uh, EV5, uh, the Bangkok Motor Show. I want to talk talk about that as well, and uh, news from China as well. So let's say hello to our regular guests as always. So we've got uh, hey Kangaroo Island, nice to see you, Stan. Nice to see you, Jason. Mark's joining us from Phillip Island, Victoria. Hello there. Hello, H2 Rider. Hello, Jim Donaldson. Hello there. Hello, Tazzy EV and Tazzy Thylacine. Nice to see you guys from Tazzy. And hello, Aaron Crofts. Hello, SWS. And hello, Steve P. Hello, Charles Gregory. Nice to see you as well. A big Tazzy contingent tonight. Uh, hello, Wayne Richardson from Toowoomba. Hello, Elizabeth. Lots of members too, Riz. Great to see. Hello, Scotty. Yeah, they're all turning up, which is great. Yeah. Hello, Jean. Oh, we've got uh, Thorn Bjorn from Sweden. Hey, nice of you to join us. What time is it in uh, in Sweden at the moment? And uh, Jay Jun from Rio de Janeiro. Hey, what time is it over there? Curious to know. Hello, Was Screamer. Hello, hello, Rob S. Nice to see you guys. Ah, oh, so good. 102 viewers already, only four minutes in. Oh. That's very encouraging. Thanks, everyone. Uh, hey, Oscar, nice to join you. Nice to join us live at the moment. So thank you for joining us. Normally watching us on replay. Cool. All right. Well, let's get into tonight's show, Riz. Uh, let's put on the first uh, article to talk about. Let's see. We've got, yeah, uh, EV sales hitting a record high in March as Tesla Model Y overtakes the Toyota Hilux Ute. How good is that? Yeah, it's been a good story um, so far. Uh, we just hope it keeps happening. Um, Toyota's got, obviously, their BZ4X in the market now. and But apart from that, not a lot, not much else. Uh, on the horizon and Tesla obviously I think we spoke about it as well massively cut prices um, on the Model Y particularly the uh, dual motor versions and it, I mean get this you've got Model Y performance now starting at I think it was, oh, from memory it was around 82 or 1000 plus on roads and I remember when after the first week when it launched in August 2022 um, they bumped the prices up and drive away prices were like nearly hundred and seven hundred and eight thousand dollars. So from hundred and eight to nearly eighty eight, that's a big, big, big drop over the years, and it's a better car. It's it's a massive discount, Riz. Like eighty two thousand nine hundred dollars uh before on roads. You know, I remember yes, you said people paying six figures for this car when it first dropped. So that's a huge, huge difference. Now's a good time to buy a performance model Y, that's for sure. I kind of do feel bad for people who did buy it early on. You know, your, your value does drop very quickly. 
but that is the nature of the game at the moment, unfortunately. Um, I, I remember buying a Model Y last year at this time. We paid, I think, 70, 72 or 73. So even in my own situation, 10 grand uh, straight away off the real drive variant. So yeah, now's a great time to get a Model Y. Um, yeah. And also, of course, uh, with the price cut comes with some variants or some colors as well uh, for the different variants. So have a look at this. So this is a uh, Legacy Model S or at Mr. Albert Sun. Uh, showing us some of the new Model Ys on display at the moment. So there we go. That's what the new colours are. So that's Quicksilver and that's uh, Ultra Red, which is the same as the Highland Model 3. I quite like that Silver Riz. It's uh, probably the first time we've had a light-coloured uh, Model 3 or Model Y, apart from the white one. Yeah, it's been a while and yeah, it does it does stand out, I guess. I mean, that's in the shade. I wonder what it's like if it if it really sort of pops out like the red does in the sun. Mm -hmm. but obviously on the lighter end of the spectrum. Um, yeah, it looks cool. Mm. And this is the Stealth Grey compared to the Quicksilver Silver Silver. Yeah. Um, be curious to see how many people actually go for the Silver. It's um, it's $2,600, I think, from Memory Extra. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's the same as um, Ultra Red, I think. Mm. So it is a multi-coat paint, and it was first unveiled when tesla opened the berlin factory in germany um they also get the cherry red which we don't get so it's a very dark deep red um nearly like sort of like maroon to a certain degree but um yeah we don't get that but we do have quicksilver now which is a good addition so i'm um, first time in um as long as i can remember we'll have a sixth mm -hmm. color yeah and first time uh, in a long time we've had a silver Tesla. Uh, mm. I've seen silver Model X and Model S back in the day, like, you know, six, seven years ago. That was discontinued, but now we've got a silver Tesla Model Y as well. And, and Tesla, as usual, just snuck these in just without much fanfa fanfare. Um, no sort of announcement, just website changed one day, and there's a few on display at the moment. This is a, I think this is a Queensland showroom. They've got it out there. Yeah, I also saw for anyone interested in the Victorian side of things, um, um, I think I saw the store manager from Mulgrave post a couple of photos up. They've got them as well. So anyone wants to check them out, visit Mulgrave in Melbourne. Um, they've got them, and I think they've got them in most showrooms across the country now. Yeah, that's cool. And I've um, asked Tesla to hopefully lend me one of these to check out as well, see if there's any, been any improvements. And I believe hardware for cameras as well and hardware for computers. If full self-driving ever does come to Australia, of course, we'll see. All right, well, let's say hello to some more of our regular viewers. Uh, hello, Terry. Nice to see you. Hello, Paul. Nice to see you as well. And Peter says, hi from Canberra. Many thanks to Mark from Canberra Electric Vehicles, sourcing a new driver's seat in his Model 3. 261,000 kilometers. Wow. wow. Amazing. Amazing. Who says EVs can't go on and on? That's great. Uh, Tazzy EVs asking, what are some Hyundai Kia figures for March? Let's yes. Look. Let me pull something up on my end because in that, in that article there at that stage, we hadn't received any figures from the high end Icona electric. Okay. So just quickly, um, Hyundai sold 504 Kona electrics this year and 140 of them were in uh, the month of March. So they're reasonable numbers, not huge numbers, but you know, I guess it's it still makes it to the top 10, which obviously we haven't got in there because they hadn't released it by the time I was putting that article up. Mm. Uh, but yeah, brings it into the top 10, probably number eight um, after the Kia EV6. Um, so 140 odd sales of the Kona Electric. Let's see if, um, if that changes as the year continues. I don't think it's a supply issue. So I wonder if, you know, maybe there's a few price cuts on the horizon for the Kona and other Hyundai Kia products as well, given everyone else has pretty much done it after Tesla, shed, you know, mm. slashing prices on the Model Ys. So let's see what happens. Yeah, that's right. See whether they all follow the leader. We know Tesla tends to just bring on a price drop or price rise without much warning. And uh, yeah, with the, you know, obviously uh, the lion's share of sales at the moment, we'll see the others follow uh shortly um yeah, speaking of kia quickly um for i guess for our audience i did hear 
um, from a relatively credible source this week that uh, the EV5 is going to be here in the next two to three months. Mm. And from the sounds of things, it's coming from China, which means we don't, we wouldn't have any supply issues. If there are any issues, it will be around either the pricing being too high um, to begin with, uh, but it's likely to be here in the next three months or so. Yeah. That's it. So, yeah, I'm curious to see if it is coming from China, whether they'll be supplied with LFP batteries, or is uh, possibly BYD blade batteries. I, I think that's the plan that mm. it, they, they will have LFP batteries, and um, I'm pretty sure they're the BYD ones as well. So, mm. if that's the case, given pretty much every other EV in the country is made in um, China as well. I know the, the Korean brands like Kia and Hyundai have previously been making them in South Korea, but there's too much competition now for that stock that's built in South Korea. So US, Hyundai, Kia and Kia are kicking goals with their electric vehicles. So a lot of that stuff that's manufactured in South Korea is more likely to head towards the US than it is here. So mm. now they've secured supply out of China, which would be quite interesting uh, to see if they can keep the prices low. Because if you can build enough interest in the very beginning of launching a car, then that sort of sustains itself. So, yeah, we'll find out. It does look good, though. Yeah, it looks great. I mean, this is very much in the same styling as the Kia EV9, which some of you might have seen my videos, uh, which, you know, is a great quality vehicle. It's just the price is a bit high, of course, but uh, well built. Fit and finish is fantastic. Uh, Hyundai's come a long way. Sorry, Kia's come a long way. Same platform. <laughs> Uh, EGMP. Uh, Actually, Tom, I think the EV5 is on a different platform. Oh, really? Yeah, it, okay. it surprised me as well when I read that. It's, uh, it's I think, a K3 or some other platform. It's, it's not EGMP, which I was surprised by myself. So mm. I guess we'll find out when Kia sends you one of those and we can <laughs> sort of compare it to the EV9. Because the K3 is actually what the new Konas are built on which is kind right. of like their B-tier platform. Obviously, EGMP is like their top, you know, their top tier platform. So, yeah, interesting, isn't it? Because it, it looks very similar to the, the Kia EV9, just the way it's the stance is and a bit more boxy. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm very interested. I could particularly because the Model Y has dropped its price as well, as we just talked about. So whether we can see this at 60 to 70 grand, Riz, so I'm, I'm very curious. Yeah, I think Jason's clarified it. It's the N3, not the K3, the N3, N3 EK platform. I see. Okay. Thank you, Jason. I'll put this up here. So it says the EV5 sits on an all-electric N3 EK platform as opposed to the Kia e Nero, which is based on the petrol-powered Nero. And now speaking of EV5, uh, Zapped, Roland from Zapped said, uh, posted some pictures of the specs and pricing in New Zealand. Let's have a look. So in New Zealand, we can expect their pricing to be, uh, what is it, uh, 67990 starting at plus on-road costs for their light, which is, I assume, uh, air. We call it air yeah. for the Kia variants here. So 67, yeah, we might be looking at sort of 65, maybe less in Australia. That would be an interesting one because I believe in New Zealand, our Model Y starts at 65000 Oh, a 65 or thousand plus on roads. So, um, yeah, if, if it's if similar sort of pricing, then if it's priced at 65,000, 63,000. Um, so there we go, 63 in Australia now. Yeah. So, yeah, okay, 65, interesting. Yeah. Let's see what else. It goes up to 70 for the longer range. Uh, and then the Earth variant, which is like dual motor, 7580, so it's getting a bit, a bit expensive there. And then GT Line, which is their like sort of performance type car, without the performance spec, just performance like, 85,000. So a bit more expensive than a Model Y performance all of a sudden. Curious. Well, this is New Zealand dollars, I know. But yeah. we'll see. Um, there is another question around Polestar, and mm. this is the first month that they're not reporting their figures. I did get a spreadsheet uh, from the Electric Vehicle Council um, with Polestar, I guess, sales for the month. 
Uh, it didn't collate it. It basically said, here's a dump of everything that's that was sold. And there were 84 records from what I could see in that. So around 80 is what they've sold in the month of mm. March. Not sure whether I'd like compared to what it used to be, the average was sort of around 150 to 200 a month. So maybe people are waiting for the Polestar 3. Yep. Or the Polestar 4, for that matter. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, look, Polestar's had the same product, essentially, bar a very, you know, minor upgrade last year. The same Polestar 2 they've had for the last two years now. So, yeah, we'll see. Mm. Um, now, a question for you, Riz. Can Hollywood... That's you. Confirm that BYD is revealing the Ute, seal you and potential large SUV or commercial van in New Zealand on 6th of June, 2024 at Mystery Creek Field Day. Right. Mm. Um, I think at least the seal you, if not, it will be revealed before that. Um, I did see somewhere on X, there's one driving around or one of the showrooms has got one in New Zealand. Um, the Ute from what I can gather, probably the second half of the year, so unlikely. Uh, but it would be ideal, though, given it is one of their big agricultural events. And last year at that event, they had the seal there way before anyone else saw it. So Adrian, our friend mm. from New Zealand, saw um, the seal way before anyone else did. So, yeah, it's likely they'll have, maybe they'll surprise us all and have the Dolphin Mini there or the Seagull. Mm. Mm. Yes, yeah, so New Zealand tends to get the jump on Australia when it comes to new EVs. Uh, they're very quick on that. So we do look across the ditch for new cars. Uh, Shalendra is saying, we haven't seen a single EV9 on the road yet. Yeah. Ooh. Okay. So they, were, they had a lot of them for Australian Open here in Melbourne, Shalendra. I'm not sure what happened to those cars, but they are pretty, still pretty rare. Um, I think from memory, what did they sell? 100 and... Uh, EV9, yeah, this they sold 17 March across the country, so not many, yeah, not many. And you've got uh, EV sales figures here is uh, for 2024 so far. We do 156. Now, one caveat there Kona Electric doesn't include March's numbers in that particular chart, but since then okay. we'll receive them from Hyundai. Um, and yeah, EV9 156 for the year, hmm. Obviously, Tesla Model Y Model 3 leading the way. And then Atto 3 and BYD Seal uh, next up. And then MG4 and doing yeah. well as well. Uh, BYD Dolphins next. And then the EV6 is doing well too, actually beating the uh, Hyundai Ionic 5. I think the EV6 has had um, huge price cuts for the 2023 build cars. Mm. So, yeah, I wonder if that's one of the contributing factors. But it is a lovely car, mm. like, you know, compared to... So where's Ionic 5 now on that list? Oh, yeah. 244. Remember about two years ago? Like, it was like a chook raffle. You couldn't get them. <laughs> and <laughs> That's right. They released them, like, you know, a few at a time, right? And people were like, you know, it's like lottery tickets or, uh, or concert tickets. Just people just yeah. trying to get them uh, really quickly. Uh, good question here from John OX. Any figures of the BZ4X sales, apart from the 200 we talked about? Yeah, so dealers? the... They had a few um, hundred odd in the month, I think. So mm -hmm. it's 311 sales, the last one on the in orange up there. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it's very hard to know a Toyota. Like the fleets love them across the country because of by Hiluxes and the rest of it. And they built a lot of um, very strong fleet partnerships over the years. Mm -hmm. They obviously sponsor the AFL as well. So, you know, very always reminding people. So there will be some Toyota people that will buy a Toyota because it's electric and the rest of it. They mm -hmm. also are very good at doing large deals with companies to sell hundreds, if not thousands of them. So, yeah, we don't know at this stage. The first couple of hundred will be, you know, dealer-related prototypes, showcase, give it to fleet managers to try out type of thing. So we'll see how that sort of establishes itself. But late last year, Toyota said themselves they didn't want to bring more than 1,500 this year. So who knows if that's still true now that we have a, some sort of fuel efficiency standard in the works. Mm. Now, I can confirm, everyone, that uh, Toyota will be loaning me a BZ4X to try out next month, Riz. 
Uh, this is good to May, see. May is going to be a very busy month for me. We've got the Toyota BZ4X and the Rolls Royce Spectre. So it's a huge month, you know. Two very similar cars. Uh, well, no, not really. <laughs> uh, but yeah, should be fun. Uh, I've got the BZ4X for a week and we'll see. We'll put it through the tests, of course, and see whether it stacks up to the price. What is the price of the BZ4X? What are we talking about here? Uh, I think it's 66 plus on roads as a starting price. Wow. Gee, that's pricey. So it's isn't not it? cheap. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'll be honest as always. Uh, won't hold back, but we'll give credit where it's due and um, run it through my reg- regular tests. Um, now, Riz, you've also got uh, an EV uptake prediction for 2024. So we've got a solid line up to. Sort of... It was up till 2022 there. And what I wanted to highlight was at the end of 2022, we sort of predicted around 125,000 electric vehicles in the country, which is where that dot for 2023 is. It turned out close to 160,000. Yep. So yeah. now we're predicting over 200 and. 50,000 EVs by the end of this year. So it'd be good comparison to see where we actually land. I'd be very happy if we get to 275. Um, yeah. But th- yeah, we'll, we'll find out. I mean, we're, we're pretty close to 200,000 right now, aren't we? And if we're doing like yep. 9, 10% sales each month, uh, we could easily reach that figure by December 2024. Fingers crossed. I, I, I guess the caveat there is that is... W- whether we'll have more price cuts from manufacturers like Tesla's done Mm -hmm. to keep the momentum going or whether fuel emission standards as the, those things start to get a bit closer, whether that's going to have an impact. So there's a few sort of balls up in the air, but yeah, ideally we would love to sort of have them at, you know, 275, 280,000 by the end of this year. Mm. Well, you're the man, Riz. You'll uh, keep us informed of the numbers. So we'll see what the predictions come through. <laughs> um, yeah, so Shalendra says, important difference between the BZ4X and the Rolls-Royce Spectre. One of them is self-recharging. <laughs> is that true? I don't think so. Still got to plug it in. <laughs> um, yep, Tazzy EV says, May the month of opposites. Definitely the EV you have a driver with and another that the driver of the Spectre drives. I'm, I'm curious to see whether the Rolls let me drive the car by myself or will they have someone with me the whole time? Will they trust me with a $770,000 vehicle before on roads and before options? Oh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm sure by the time they, they, whatever they want to show you is going to be close to a million dollars. <laughs> so, <laughs> Money, money. All right. Um, cool. Let's move on to this article here. So... Um, now, Nash is telling us that, yes, the Alexandra Body Repair Center is now officially open. This is the Tesla official body repair center. So this is, I think, Australia's first one in-house yeah. um, body shop. So it would be good, convenient for us Sydney siders. Hopefully more to come across Australia. Uh, yep. Okay, so SWS is asking me to check the insurance policy for the Spectre. That's a good point, actually. Uh, I do make sure I know what the excess is for all the press cars I loan. Might be worth more than my house. <laughs> good point. Thanks, SWS. Uh, yeah, Jason Oakley, do you just plug the car into the V2L and it can charge itself? Well, we'll, we'll test that theory, right? Toyota self-charging vehicle. Um, very funny. Okay, so this is some specs on the Model 3 Ludicrous. Yeah, it seems pretty pretty legit. Uh, this guy on X seems to know what's being put into European regula- regulatory systems. So, yeah, as it stands, um, roughly the same weight as the current Model 3 performance. Um, relatively large power upgrade over the current one i think the current one's 366 kilowatts or sorry the previous one because they don't sell one at the moment Mm -hmm. so that's nearly 100 more kilowatts compared to the last one in terms of power um range is lower um but they are different motors to what's found in the long range this time around and tesla usually doesn't do this 
what they had in the previous performance were the same motors as the, what they had in the long range, only mm -hmm. beefed up a bit. But these are like new motors that are going to be going in. So, yeah, let's let's find out. The interesting part is there is an optional 19-inch wheel as well compared to the 20s that come standard. The last generation, as far as I could tell, the performance only came with Uber turbines. Mm. Hmm. Well, if we scroll down here to the next uh, reply, so he's said that the ludicrous one will be 10 kilograms heavier, uh, battery packs unchanged, 35 kilowatts up in power, torque down by 2 newton meters, range down by 19 kilometers, as you said, Riz, maximum speed unchanged, and wider rear tires there was another bit of goss there that and it's we'll find out but apparently it has faster charging than the long range and some hidden specs say up to 306 kilowatts which is above the 250 that the last generation car was rated at so we'll find out could all be just speculation but yeah um it this shouldn't be too far from um you know getting unveiled um some say it's going to be on april the 20th 420 uh mm -hmm. but we'll find out yeah if 305 that means the v3 superchargers won't be able to charge them to its max you know charge yeah. you need a v4 supercharger uh or That's... a tritium or something else that goes at 350 kilowatts 350 yeah interesting all right, we'll, uh, we'll hold you to that risk. 20th of April, that's in 10 days' time. <laughs> we'll see. All right, so we talked about this earlier. So the Cyberster has been making its way up and down the East Coast. So first spotted in Sydney uh, last, well, two weeks ago, and then spotted in Melbourne uh, this week. And photo credit to Chris Q. There it is there. And I think Mark also saw it as well. Just going through my LinkedIn posts here, so... Spotted in Sydney last week. Definitely the same car, FFH mm -hmm. 29E. And David from MG Go ahead, went one further and showed us hey, one in the garage. It's a different, different plate there. Yeah, it is, isn't it? That's another one. <laughs> They've got more. Testing. <laughs> Maybe that one's for us. It's just yeah, charging up. Month of May is busy. Cyberster, Spectre, BZ4X. That'd be a cool car to drive around. You're very cool. Um, and then today, just fresh off the press, uh, Duncan on X spotted one in Adelaide. This is the FFH one. Yeah, that's it. It's gone from Victoria to Adelaide now. Yeah. So there you go. It can make a trip. Um, now, what car is this next to it? It's a Taycan Cross Turismo, I think. Ah. So that's the va it looks like the wagon. It's even got the roof racks on it. So yeah, very very cool. Now I'm glad I know where this charger is. This is in Adelaide CBD, um, and the Tesla superchargers are behind, like behind the camera. So I'm glad they've actually replaced these. If it is the same location I'm thinking of, I'm glad they replaced them with chem power chargers, because the old chargers were I think vandalized quite often. Right. If someone from South Australia can confirm that for me, I think. I think if that's the same charger location I thought it was. Thanks, Duncan, for that. Cool. Um, so just back on the BZ4X in the US, Toyota is already offering $10,000 off a lease for this car. Interesting. Uh, so what is it in the US? It's asking $43,000. That'll be about 60 here in Australia. Yeah. Okay. And now let's talk about the Bangkok International Motor Show. Uh, so EV shares soared to 33% from the show. So that's that's pretty good. 27.5%. Oh, sorry, that's Toyota. But EV shares the 33%. Pretty impressive. Lots of interest. That's a huge show compared to you know, what we have or we, we have had here. Mm. Um, and just the, the, the size of the stalls, seen a few walk around videos as well as some of the pictures that, that audience have been sharing with you, Tom. And yeah, it just looks massive. It's, it's huge. I've got lots of videos, which I'm going to compile together in a separate video 
uh, standalone video, but I just want to show uh, just a quick snapshot of something. I'll just see if I can find it. Here we go. So hopefully this works. So this is the Lotus stall or stand. Be cool to attend the show, Riz. Yeah, very cool to see. It's just so big. Yeah. That's the Elytra. It's good to see so many EVs too. Like a lot of the ones we don't get here in Australia. We probably never will. Um, a lot of EV bikes too. Being Thailand. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. I'll see if I can find more. Uh, and also the um, the Beijing Auto Show is coming up too. Yeah, and I think a um, week or two's time starts for about 10 days. Replace the Shanghai uh, for the year and then next year it's back to Shanghai. Yep. Now, I'll just show you the BYD stand. Um, here we go. See, why are we getting the sea line here? <laughs> That's cool. It's such a huge show. So many cars. That's a nice looking car. Mm. There's so much happening. Dolphin. I think that's the seal you next to it, possibly. Uh, the Tang, maybe? See this is the seal you here? Yeah, that's what we're getting, the hi hybrid. Yeah. It's a shame. Yeah, nice. And thanks to uh, viewer Steve A, if you're watching today. Thanks for um, sharing that with us. It's great. Um, let's see if I can find one more. So this one. Now, Aeon. I think Aeon are coming to Australia too, Riz, aren't they? Right on the street is. The electric yeah. street. They are. <laughs> Look at that car. Hyper SSR. Amazing. Ooh, Falcon wings. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a lot of people though, a lot of interest. I don't know why. Honda's there too. Very, very well attended. This is probably the car we're going to get if we if and when they do launch as a starting right. point, the Ion Y. Cool. Wow, that's a huge stand. Awesome. Uh, awesome. Thank you again, Steve A, for that. Appreciate it. I'll, uh, as I said, I'll put a, uh, I'll put together a standalone video. Uh, to showcase some of those uh, some of those cars. All right, so let's move on to this article here. Class actions against Toyota and Ford over faulty vehicles to be heard in high court. Oh, it's uh, it's been a while this since this one's been coming. So Toyota has got to do with their diesel particulate filters in their Hiluxes and their other diesel vehicles. And Ford, who knows what they're in trouble for again. They were, they paid $10 million of a fine a couple of years ago for misleading consumers about their automatic transmissions. So who knows if this is an emission one or not for Ford, but Toyota definitely to do with the diesel particulate filters. Mm. Yes. Sad but true. We'll see what happens. All right, let's talk about this one. So a um, bit of uh, interesting news this week. Um, now Reuters was reporting that apparently leaked reports from Tesla that uh, Elon Musk had shut down its $25,000 Model 2 or smaller Tesla EV. Uh, and then I think Elon came back to say on X that uh, Reuters have been lying again. 
So, is this true or not? Is Tesla selling out its $25,000 Model 2 in place of robo-taxi development? Um, maybe it is true to, this, to the extent that it's uh, likely that they want the engineers to be working on the robo-taxi first and the Model 2 will be an offshoot of that. Mm -hmm. um, because ideally, Tesla wants to be making millions of those robo-taxis. You know, you think about Uber and where they are and how many cars they would have across the world or their, you know, what they call their driver partners. If the robot taxi is supposed to replace them, then it would need to be built. They would need to build millions of them. Millions. And, so, and they need to do it cost effectively as well. So maybe that's where it's all happening, that FSD, the new updates in America are so good, according to Tesla or Elon Musk, that they want to focus their efforts on that. But I doubt that the actual Model 2 is cancelled because... At the same time, we have um, Tesla potentially building a pretty large factory in India. Um, Self-driving cars may not work in every part of the world, um, you know, because you need line markings and a whole lot of other things. A lot of them don't even work well in Australia because, as we say, the, the ADAS systems don't really work too well, as we've seen with BYD, and we heard when we went to the Cherry launch as well. So, it, you know, it's a long way to go before we have full autonomy. But at the same time, um, I, I think they'll need to build the actual Model 2 with a steering wheel that people can drive and buy affordably. But at the same time, focusing a lot more effort into the robo taxi, which could be the same car, one with the steering wheel and one without one. I guess the question is, like, should they have done this three years ago? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. They, they've kind of, they're focusing a lot on Cybertruck and then obviously FSD as well. Could this car have come out three years ago alongside Model Y, uh, make it profitable for the company? Uh, are they allowing Chinese cars to, you know, come into the market with the MG4s and now with the, you know, the BYD Dolphin Mini or Seagull coming in as well? Other smaller brands as we've seen at the auto show. I don't know. Is it is it too late for the Model 2? Um, I think the difficulty three years ago would have been sort of the start of COVID. And, mm. you know, the battery prices went through the roof and a whole lot of other things happened. But at the same time, yeah, in, in normal circumstances, they could have started quite early and had the Model 2 up and running. Um, I don't think Tesla would have had the scale to do what they've done now. So they've got, you know, in the last three years, they've got Berlin, they've got Shanghai has really started to pump cars out. They've got Texas factory being built. So there's been a lot that's been happening. And then, you know, they announced the Mexican factory to build the Model 2, but then they changed their plans because they realized the engineers that were going to be working on the production line were probably likely to be found in and around Texas or in the US. And they're unlikely to move to a new location. So given they already had the land and everything else in Texas, and that's the head office now, they want to do the first production run out of there. So that's still going ahead. But then at the same time, Elon's announced that um, 8th of August mm. is when the unveil of the robo taxi is. Yeah. And the question is, you know, it's, as you said, Riz, one with the steering wheel, one without. Um, yeah, how big is the robo taxi? Can people buy a robo taxi or is it just part of the fleet that people have to um, use, right? Mm. So um, that's very curious. It's sort of very, all of a sudden, like 8th of the 8th, this is the date we're going to use um, off the cuff, right? But very then FSD, FSD, what happens there? Because it's not ready to leave the US yet. And, oh, well, maybe Canada, but it's not ready to leave that part of the world yet. Mm. Um, a lot of the regulation isn't ready anywhere else in the world. No because you can't possibly drive a car with the, or, or have a driverless car um, that's at scale running across multiple countries without the regulation sort of allowing for that type of technology on their roads. So while that still hasn't been cracked, I can't imagine robot taxi coming, bam, but they can't operate anywhere. So that's yeah. gonna kill Tesla as a business. It'd be very much confined in North America if, that's, if that, that's all they're doing, they're testing in, in the US and possibly Canada. 
you know, our roads are definitely very different over here. We've, we've had people test on our roads recently, we know from last year. I haven't heard much more since then. Um, so I'm very curious. And, and, you know, of course, we've got stories like this, for example, uh, autonomous testing being done in China. Uh, some good work done, do, do, getting done there too. Again, for their roads only in China, whether it sort of uh, translates across to our part of the world either. I think that's Tesla's big key threat. The, the autonomy and the robotaxi stuff of what's going on in China. Um, there is a level of, you know, democratization of this technology happening. The hardware is with, you know, NVIDIA or Qualcomm. It's pretty standard stuff. Xiaomi creates a new car three years time. It's mm. out. It's, you know, they've unveiled it. It's being delivered and it's got autonomous driving technology of some sort, right? They didn't spend 10 plus years building anything. They're just buying it from somewhere and then, you you know, doing their own testing and trialing. And it seems to work from what I can see so far. So that's what Tesla's biggest threat is when it comes to autonomous driving. And the conditions are very different in, in, in China in terms of the tech the internet of things or the the way the traffic systems and everything work they talk to each other it's very different and these companies can work with baidu and others to do mapping to do high definition mapping across china um it's just a place where robo taxis can thrive uh us and the rest of the world doesn't really have that yet so that's what tesla's competing with the other thing that came to my mind this week was if for whatever reason, um, Tesla did um, sort of scrap the Model 2 that you can actually drive. Um, I, they wouldn't want to come out and actually say that right now because it would like scare the investors heaps and the stock would plummet and a whole lot of other pain is going to come to the brand that it doesn't need right now. Uh, but at the same time, if they say if they release too much information on the Model Two, then I think Elon's previously mentioned as well that it's very it's very quick for the Chinese automotive industry to pick up the clues and you know connect the dots and have something before Tesla can have something out there. Mm. So they don't want to give too much information away at this stage. So maybe it's a bit of a hush hush until they're very confident and ready to reveal something that they can launch very quickly. This is true. I mean, you know, Tesla's lead is still the fact that they promote FSD a lot. That is like what is separating them from the market. And obviously the holy grail of FSD is level five, full automation, where it's like no restriction. The car drives itself, like the stuff, is, stuff of sci-fi, basically. Even as, um, as uh, where is it I'm seeing here, Waymo uh, is just, you know, level four autonomy. It's still geofenced in certain areas, so it's not going out of, like, a certain zone. And, you know, even current autopilot and a lot of self, um, a lot of, uh, you know, auto steer at the moment is still level two. You still have to pay attention and keep your hands on the wheel at all times because you just don't know what's going to happen. I mean, the FSD beta or supervisor I'm seeing in the US, that's maybe level three at best. You know, it's it's doing its own thing, but you still got to take over at any time. Mm. So yeah, I'm I'm curious to see you know where where this will be all end up. And then Rachel's making a good point here. Rachel saying the part of this puzzle I don't get is how Tesla will overcome regulatory barriers and still stay ahead of the competitors. Mm. Uh, regulators are notoriously slow and reluctant. Competition advance. Uh, I just don't know. Is Australia is going to be a very curious place to ever allow anything like this in the next five years? Well, that's right. I think the first test that we can do is get one down here in Melbourne and see if it can do a hook turn. <laughs> um, and if it can do that, it can drive anywhere. Um, but no, I, in reality, all those comments are very valid because regulation is huge. And one thing that we've sort of seen from the outside anyway, and maybe we can get Elliot to come in a couple of months' time and tell us about it on the show. Mm. But they like the, the Chinese regulators, they make it work. They, if they see an advantage to say, you can't do this in the US, um, and the only way to do it is to do it in China, they will make it happen. They will basically mm -hmm. carve the path for robo taxis to come and actually make a big impact because they don't want to lose on this technology either. Mm. So it's, um, it, you know, 
for anyone that's interested, this whole thing is around art artificial intelligence and AI. There's a very book, a very good book I read a couple of years ago, and it's called AI Superpowers. And it's, um, I think it's Silicon Valley, uh, China, and the New World Order. Mm -hmm. And this is where all of this is going, because if China can win on this front in terms of having strong autonomous driving, huge electric vehicle production, robo-taxi production, automotive world there and transport, they can win in a lot of places. So this is getting quite exciting. And I'm hoping that we're going to learn quite a lot more on 8th of August. Yeah, again, Riz, like it's, you know, it's still very utopian or dystopian sci-fi where you need a very controlled society. And obviously China being China, they can probably do that. Uh, they can control their citizens more to an extent than we can here where they can you know set boundaries on roads they can fix all the lane markings properly cars can do what they want i just don't see that happening here anytime soon it's just it's just too much to control at the moment it's such a big country uh, our roads aren't great all the time um you know I, again china can master it there can it be translated over here in australia that, that is and, the and question that's the other side of the coin is Tesla really on the right path? Because they may be on the path where, hey, our cars are smart enough where they can do that without regulation mm. in terms of they need regulation to operate, but the cars and the, and the neural net and the FSD system is smart enough to can adapt to way more situations than, let's say, a system that's trained for the Chinese market can. Yep. Because all of a sudden, it doesn't have these guidelines or rules or whatever to work with where mm -hmm. Tesla's FSD system could possibly be doing that. Um, mm -hmm. Another quick note I saw this week was Waymo has been running back by Google and Alphabet. It's been running for a while in San Francisco. And I think they've done around about 20, mi 20 million miles in their fleet. And Tesla's just surpassed 1 billion miles of FSD driving. So who knows what that's worth, but that's where things are going now that in the us the self sorry the, the self-driving technology is that tesla's got such a huge lead from what they say in terms of the million mile um million yeah sorry one billion miles of mm -hmm. full self-driving and that's increasing exponentially in terms of how many miles these cars are clocking up now that more and more of them are able to have fsd mm -hmm. so yeah, I, I guess before the end of this year, we will know a lot more about what's going to happen. But I highly doubt that Model 2 is dead because mm. they need it for the next stage of Tesla's expansion. Yeah, I hope not. I hope we see that as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, look, without without geofencing or without boundaries, sure, we can have limitless uh, situations where FSD could work without any boundaries or any legislation or regulations. But I'm not a software engineer, but that would require almost infinite amount of computing power and storage for every known possibility that can happen on the road. There's almost infinite, you know, situations where an accident could happen or near misses, right? So again, I'm, I'm, I don't really have much expertise in this field, but just logically thinking it's going to require a lot of computing power. So we'll see. Uh, I'm curious to see, of course, we live in exciting times. Um, yeah, a lot of miles, as you said, Riz, compared to um, compared to what others have been doing. Yeah, the other question too is, you know, Waymo is using lidar, radar, whereas Tesla's banking on a camera-based future. I mean, as John OX says, is that enough? You know, uh, is camera enough, or do we need uh, all five sensors? You know, uh, radar, That's lidar included. Another gamble that uh, Tesla took, and a story I read, actually, it was a tweet uh, or X from a very credible source in China. He may work for Tesla, I'm not sure. But Chris Zeng put out something that there's uh, reports now coming out that most Chinese OEMs that are using LiDAR for, for autonomous driving are thinking about ditching it. So it's expensive equipment. Um, maybe computer vision is getting that good or whatever Tesla's been doing. <laughs> Although it's it hasn't always worked, you know, straight out of the box, but it seems to be doing a bit better. So, yeah, maybe that's where they're heading, that they don't need all this additional hardware and to control and the calibrations if you can just use vision with better, more high-definition cameras and, you know, more processing power, which has been, I think, the big, big issue that if you're recording high-definition video, 
you need to propose mm -hmm. you need to process it very quickly exactly. so maybe those processes are getting much better by nvidia and others that can do that so it really exciting time but yeah it's anyone's game oh it really is yeah yeah i mean look who would have thought right back in 1980 that uh, we need more than eight megabytes isn't that what bill gates said of, yeah. uh, of ram so <laughs> yeah I, I, yeah our puny minds can't compute how much how much uh, more of a leap technology will be in 10 years time so yeah as I said, we live in exciting times. Good to have this philosophical discussion, though. Uh, yeah. Very interesting. All right, so moving on. Uh, Neo Firefly. Speaking of small cars, uh, new spy shots revealed. Look at this. This could be the Model 2 competitor. <laughs> it, it could possibly be. Tesla killer. So this is... <laughs> um, yeah, cool. Is, is, is that a small SUV or is that a hatchback? Hatch. What do you think, Tom? Mazda 2 size, yeah. Very small, right? Um, yeah. Uh, what is it? Two hundred thousand yuan. What's how much is that? Uh, is oh no look, I think uh, maybe look. forty thousand Australian no, dollars. Even, oh yeah, forty thousand Aussie. Twenty-seven thousand US. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, we, we do need small cars like that. Um, not everybody wants a big SUV. Like I see a lot of smaller Mazda twos, um, little Corollas driving around. So. Yeah, I think this this is the kind of thing we could want we could have in Australia for sure. Kia Picantos of the world. Yes. Um, oh, my my mistake, everyone. So Jason's saying it's uh, sixty four kilobytes, and same with Peter. Thank oh. you. Not eight megabytes. Eight megabytes is too much. You don't need that much RAM. <laughs> Six forty is enough. Uh, a lot of you wanting to drive as well. I, I'm with you guys. I I quite enjoy driving actually. Um, I feel a bit more stressed with autopilot on in the city. Not that you really should be using it in the city, but even on the freeways, um, sometimes you kind of have to monitor and, and sort of supervise a bit more. Um, so I don't know. I've I've tried navigating on autopilot on some of the motorways in Sydney. It it is a bit more stressful. You have to monitor what you're doing. So if you can go beyond the stress of monitoring to the car doing its own thing, like. That's that's the holy ground. It's like level three, level four, level five autonomy. That's uh, that's what I'd love. So I can do something else in the car as opposed to driving. Will we see that in our lifetime, Riz? That is the question, uh, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I guess we'll find out on 8th of August. That's, that's the start of something. <laughs> that's right. Very auspicious date, 8th of August. Um, now, speaking of uh, Chinese cars, so BYD posted this uh, kind of strange X this week. This very colorful pickup truck or ute coming soon dot 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 yeah it's uh i think it's they're later confirmed that it is the plug-in hybrid but mm. i guess we'll find out um probably second half of the year yep yep we know from um elliot's x last week that the geely radar or radaria or radaria that's uh, coming soon too or they're making it in right hand drive so i would have thought australia would be getting it too so good to see more utes coming to the country, electric utes. Uh, back on BYD, so BYD's second generation blade battery to launch this year as well. Interesting. So it's currently already on the E Platform 3. So what can the new generation blade battery bring to the table? I think more energy density, as they're saying in this article, because um, yep. that was one of the things that was lower than nmc batteries or ncm batteries yep. so that's one thing and then you know catl other big battery makers working on other battery technologies as well so just the progress is very you know it's 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 happening very quickly now so that's it's good to see which means smaller battery packs less weight uh likely to give more range um so yeah i think this should be quite interesting to see when they get the first ones into cars and your mate uh wang chan fu um is saying yeah uh 1000 kilometers of range well CLTC, yeah, the, anyway yeah he did mention that when um when i met with him that they're secretly working on something so that's <laughs> probably what it was or he's always getting the scoops very nice yep all right well uh, we look forward to that course um now actually i was going to say yeah jason's saying that the byd ute had the opera house on the side let's go back to that oh look at this there's some sales on the side 
on the front too. <laughs> it's a clue. Good pickup, Jason. That's very good pickup. Literally, pun intended. Very nice. It's almost the yeah three on one side, two on this side. Wow, very subtle clue. Interesting. Nice spot. Um, and Bridie posting that uh, 2024 Zika 001 sets DC fast charging record 546 kilowatts peak. 10 to 80% 10 to in 11.5 minutes. That's huge. It's very quick. Um, I guess the question becomes, I don't know how relevant these stats are anymore. <laughs> like, in, in the sense that, you know, majority of the cars, even if they can charge that fast, there aren't many, there, there'll be no charger in Australia that would sort of charge at that speed for public charging anyway. Even mm. the 350s that we've got, the older tritiums, they're a bit of a dying breed. Mm. So unless we get some one megawatt charges that are used to you know, charge trucks and buses, it's unlikely we're ever going to see those speeds here. I look with the um, eGMP cars and the Porsche Taycan as well, 800 volt architecture. You can get 20% to 80% in 15 to 20 minutes. And I've tested this. Mm. It's pretty impressive, right? You know, 15 to 20, it's good enough to go to the toilet, have a little break and come back. It's almost done. Like it's, that's pretty good already. It's too fast sometimes if you've got a young family, you know, by the time you get the kids out of the, of the car, it's time to get them back in again. And anyone, anyone of the children will know how hard that is to do. So, I mean, 15 to 20 is pretty good. And even like 30, 30 minutes for most Teslas, mm. um, it, that's, you know, I think that's acceptable really. But 11.5 minutes for 10 to 80%, that's insane. That's like crazy quick. I mean, sometimes school holiday like periods, you can't pump your petrol that quick by the time you have to go in and pay. Like you're spending 15 to 20 minutes sometimes in a queue. So, yeah. No, the only thing quicker than this is battery swap that Neo does. So... <laughs> <laughs> that's right um go riz some people are saying we should call that the byd shark <laughs> it's a shame it's a plug-in that's the only thing yeah broken rachel's heart rachel saying uh i think riz has broken her heart i want it to be a full bev that looks fully trade-esque not a hybrid well that's the plan that if we uh, then i've heard contradicting stories that Next year is probably when the full EV version is coming. Um, this <laughs> Lightning McQueen. <laughs> this is where it's from. Yeah. Uh, John OX looks like in a few years, EV chargers will be like gas stations. Yeah. yeah. If they can safely charge that quick, 10 to 80% in 11.5 11, 11 minutes. Um, Jason saying, I did a road trip to Bris Vegas from mid north coast, New South Wales last week. People can were surprised how how far the seal premium can go on a charge. Yeah, it's got a good range. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, how much do I spend on the toilet? Uh, how much time do I spend on the toilet? Uh, well, that's a very personal question, but it depends. Sometimes, you know, if it's charging that quick. <laughs> <laughs> Discharging that quick. Discharging that quick. <laughs> Peter's saying, too fast. I don't want to charge that fast. I can't yeah. even get to a bathroom break and a coffee in 10. It's very true. Uh, Charles agrees with us. I think once you get to under 10 minutes, it's too quick. It means you need to wait and stand next to your... That's very true. Suddenly Toyota's correct. You do have to stand next to your car if it's under 10 minutes. They want to something here. Um, that's time wasted. Well, I mean, you got to stand next to your car when you pump petrol, right? Um, although in the US, there is, you can actually... Yeah, There's a little lift, a little yeah. latch. You can like leave it there for a while. Hmm. Well, Ooh. they probably need it because some of the gas guzzlers have like what 100, and 100 plus liters of fuel tanks that you know you can't just stand there for. <laughs> That's right. Good question from EV Switch. Is that speed too uh, quick? Like, is it bad for battery health? Well, that is the thing, isn't it? We don't know yet. Mm. That's right. Uh, yeah, put ads on the chart. Well, yeah, that's right. Like Jolt, they've got ads on the chargers. That's how they make the money, I think. Um, time wasted for you, but time saved for the charging provider. More cars can pass through. Yep, very true. Here's another interesting sort of question, right? What happens um, 
when let's say a charger that can output 600 kilowatts and it costs you three dollars a kilowatt hour to pump that in compared to uh let's say 350 kilowatt charger that you're paying 90 cents a kilowatt hour for would someone pay three times two to three times as much to get that much juice in in such a short period of time when you're saving five minutes yeah that's a good question isn't it um depends how much of a hurry you're in yeah i mean at the moment like i've seen petrol prices two dollars plus so anything above sort of two bucks then ev charging is still much cheaper even on a dc fast charger so i guess it depends how much time your time is worth uh, yeah. you know most people happy to drive a bit slower on holidays you know, occasionally someone is in a rush but i don't know well, maybe maybe you can have the option right you can pay a bit more to go faster um Again, Riz, like, like you said, I, I, we're going to have charges that can actually do this kind of speed. That's the question. So worth people installing these things. Yeah, and I think that this is where it's like today, right? What happens in the same town if you have a Tesla supercharger and you drive a Tesla, which means you can charge it, either of mm -hmm. those Tesla or non-Tesla chargers. There's a few people that will still go to a non-Tesla charger because it's 60 cents a kilowatt hour instead of 70 uh, and if you're driving a non-Tesla, which most cars can't charge, you know, I think what Model 3 or Y with LFP batteries, 170 kilowatts, most of them can't charge more than that anyway, so they don't use the 350s. Mm. So, yeah, once we do have this technology, I, I'd like to think we'll have more chargers rather than few chargers that can pump over 600 kilowatts in. And, and Peter makes a good point. We, we learned about this uh, at Everything, Everything Electric. You know, a lot of the providers are being slugged with higher charging rates. And that's why we're not seeing as many fast chargers because they get charged for what the charger maximum. can output. Yeah. yeah. The, the maximum ceiling, even though it doesn't, it rarely goes to that high. Um, that's why EVs had to raise their prices over the last six months. Mm. So, yeah. Um, unless there's some change from how providers, you know, like people like, I don't know, Ausgrid and stuff, how they sell their energy to these uh, providers these third-party providers something's going to change for sure all right let's push on almost at the end here so we've got speaking of chargers we've got um, an ldv e deliver 7 spotted in the wild charging at a charge fox charger at karua new south wales so this is a potential problem we've got you know people putting or well, companies putting their charge ports at the side of a van like that uh, it doesn't matter how long your cable is, it may not be able to reach, and you've got to block two charges to get a charge. Hmm. So, I don't know, what's the answer? Longer cables, drive through stalls, uh, yes. some sort of um, you know, regulation that charges, charge ports need to be at a certain distance, I don't know. Gantries, that's what we need. We need gantries. gantries. <laughs> Pull down gantries. <laughs> no, I think drive through, surely drive through stalls yeah. for these things. That's got to be the answer. GridServe, you got to come over, help us out. <laughs> Something's got to change. I think I think we need a whole variety of different charging solutions, right? But mm. drive-through makes sense in most locations, but at the same time, at petrol stations, you can't always drive through or have the chargers next to the petrol pumps. The ideal places for these vans to charge is really at their depots. Overnight, mm. in the morning, it's full. Most of them don't do like most delivery vans don't do more than 200 kilometers a day and batteries in most of these vans are sort of around 150 to 200 kilometers um but yeah i, I think we need more dedicated um truck and van stops mm. for electric vehicle charging when it, it's going to happen quicker than we think in the next mm. two years we will have plenty of dedicated stops for these commercial vehicles yeah, like the drive through stalls we saw in WA um, mm. last week. So, no promise. Yeah, that's right. You can uh, pull your caravan through. Now, uh, speaking of ChargeFox, there's a trial to some select users um, that ChargeFox are allowing some NRMA chargers to appear on the app. Um, just a small trial for now. I'm sure there'll be a greater release eventually. So, I mean, this makes sense. You know, we, we know mm. NRMA uh their charge well charge fox was sold to the australian motoring services i think the group including which includes an rma so it makes sense for uh charge fox to host the NRMA rma charges on the app 
and I guess part of it is the NRMA's own app today. I had the pleasure of using it at Mitagong once, and it's um, the ChargeFox app just feels more better for charging. Mm. So yeah, I think that's that's probably a better thing as well. You have one app to do the charging bit, um, and then NRMA app to get discounts and whatever else you're looking for. But you can't have two apps embedded into one. Uh, it just doesn't lead to a good. There's a lot of swiping in the NRMA app, and I got confused with where I was swiping and what for. Yep. Uh, but yeah, ChargeFox app is very simple. You click on the charger, and then you just, you know, if you're plugged in, you can start the charge. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. It's, it's ChargeFox has had years to, you know, to to perfect uh, its art, so to speak. A lot of feedback from customers. So I think ChargeFox makes sense to host NRMA. What about like RAA um, and other, you know, They're RACQ? The ChargeFox, app. ChargeFox. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. They're already there. Excellent. Um, and Jason's on the stream, so he helped with this post. So it looks like EV's also doing peak times, uh, variable pricing rates throughout the day. Makes sense. Cheaper at off peak times. So thanks, Jason, for that. And almost at the end here, um, Billy, I think, is also watching at the moment, shared with us for his electric garbage truck in Sydney. I'm an EV, breathe easier. It's happening. Yeah, that's definitely George Street. See the tram tracks there. Yeah, I wonder if it's allowed to go onto the tram tracks afterwards when it's done its shift and just, you know, blend in with the trams. <laughs> Probably not, no. <laughs> but um, yeah, maybe breathing easier with no emissions from the tailpipe, but considering the payload, possibly not. Um, but no, good, good to have EVs. As you said, you know, two commercial vehicles like this charge at the depot at the end of the day and good to go for the next day. So it makes a lot of sense. Good to see the city of Sydney getting on board there. Um, I just want to also shout out to David, if you're watching, sent me a whole bunch of videos and photos from a uh, shopping mall in Shanghai in China with some cars uh, that hopefully we'll get one day in Australia. But uh, I'll show you some of these pics. So this is the Li Mega. Uh, awesome, luxurious people mover. It's pretty cool. This charge is faster than that Zika. Yeah, that's right. With yeah. the with the Shenzhen battery. Yeah, crazy. Yeah. Looks so comfortable. Look at those executive seats. Um, and also this is the um the Avatar Avatar Twelve. That's a sleek looking car. Cool. Yeah. It's got digital mirrors as well, I think, on the sides. Yes. Is, um... Yes, I believe so. Yep. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Very premium. It's got a hatch opening too. Yep. Um, and then this is the Zika, I think. Yep. Zika 007. Yep. That's a pretty, pretty swish looking vehicle too. We are getting the Zeke here in Australia, but not the 007, I think. Yeah, it's... And then finally some um, some Polestar 4 walk-arounds as well. So, I guess we don't have a timeline yet for the Polestar 4. Looks great. Yeah, very cool. Hopefully we'll see this in Chadston late this year. Yeah, I think it's uh, second half and it will be launching in the red, well, pretty much all of Australia. Um, pricing is, what is it? I think it's 88000 plus on roads or something like that as a starting price, oh, wow. which is not cheap, but it's not too bad. Um, I guess we'll find out. The, the demand between Polestar 4 and the bigger SUV Polestar 3 when it launches mm. in a couple of months' time. Interesting times ahead for Polestar. Um, let's take some more comments before we end the stream today. So Nick is saying Robo Rubbish Trucks <laughs> is a good idea. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, Rachel's saying, why can't we just have nice things like tapping my credit card without an app? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yep. Um, 
So one in Gundagai, NRMA, or Charge Fox. That is a Charge Fox, I believe. It's a bit confusing sometimes. We've got both. I think that one's a Charge Fox one. Yep. Um, here you go. Gundagai used to be owned by Charge Fox. Soul transfer to NRMA. Okay, it's, it is confusing. Uh, Charge Fox owned by AMS, which is jointly owned by all the road services companies, but oddly the South Australian charges have got transferred to NRMA, not RAA. Yeah, that's weird. Yep, yep. Okay, so Jason's saying, due to launch in Australia in the second half of 2024 with two models, Zika 009 electric pupil mover and Zika X electric small SUV. Uh, that's, that's an interesting point. People movers. Like, they're nice, they look luxurious and all the rest of it, but nobody buys them in Australia. So, you know, Honda couldn't sell their Odyssey, which used to be one of the more popular ones. Kia Carnival uh, does sell, but they have many applications for that car. Mm. So, yeah, I'm not sure what's going to happen here, but I guess we'll find out. Zika X, I think, should be okay. That's similar to the Volvo EX30 which should be landing in Australia in the next month or two. Mm. So I think, yeah, Tom, I'm sure you'll definitely get a chance to review uh, EX30 and then you'll be all prepared for when Zika X launches because under the skin, it will be exactly the same. I hope so. I hope so. It looks like a good car from what I've seen from overseas models. So, yep, fingers crossed we'll get one of those to check out. All right, everyone. Well, that uh, might be it for tonight. So, uh, yeah, thanks again for joining us. I think 174 viewers at uh, the hour and 12 minute mark is pretty good, isn't it? Uh, thanks for all your engagements and questions and comments. Love having you guys on the chat. And Riz, thank you as always for joining us on Wednesday night. Anytime, Tom. So good to have everyone contributing and, you know, all the photos and images and videos that we've seen from all around the world. It's you guys that make the show happen. So spot something take a photo of it safely and, and, and send it through, <laughs> you know, tag Tom in it uh, myself. And yeah, really, really good to see. I think we're just going to see so many more EVs launching. So exciting time. And I'm really excited about, uh, you know, April the 20th, uh, uh, yes. which is supposedly when the Model 3 Ludacris comes out. Uh, not long after, we have the Tesla's earning call, which Elon will have to answer lots of tough questions mm. about whether it's cancelled or not. And then later this year, 8th of the 8th, when the robo taxi arrive and we are living in the future. That's right. Cannot wait. And of course, uh, the month of May is very exciting for us as well. We've got uh, Rolls Royce Spectre, BZ4X, uh, lots of good stuff. And I'm about to release my Abarth video very soon too. And I'm driving the Peugeot E2008 at the moment. So that will be coming out as well on the channel. And I'll have a Bangkok motor show walk around thanks to steve a as well thanks to his videos from on the ground in bangkok for the 45th annual uh bangkok international motor show with lots of evs to showcase cool all right well thanks everyone thanks riz and uh we shall see you all next week on ludicrous feed live as always take care and ciao happy charging see ya <laughs>